Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the second guest speaker, uh, Professor uh, Nick Huang from the National University of Singapore. Um, uh, Professor Huang did his um, PhD at uh, the University of Maryland, uh, where he works on uh, worked on syntax and has now transitioned into uh, psycholinguistics, acquisition and processing um, of, uh, uh, of of human language, um, looking at questions like how do children uh, come up with rules based on linguistic experience and um, uh, uh, but still from a, a descriptive uh, perspective, what still trying to figure out, well, what are the rules that uh, that the children come up with? He's published extensively in high profile journals like NLLT, LI, Language Acquisition, Journal of East Asian Linguistics, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and presented at uh, NELS, uh, high profile conferences like NELS, WICFL, NACL, and AJAL. AJL, sorry. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, uh, take it away. All right. So thank you for the very kind introduction. And I want to say thank you to the organizers for making this you know, in-person conference possible. It's really uh, exciting to be back here in person right after like a couple of years of COVID. Okay, so uh, today what I'll be doing is to tell you about some of my work on uh, the role of linguistic experience and our theories of language. So uh, just a quick definition by linguistic experience. I'm just referring to the kinds of sentences, utterances, phrases that we come across in our everyday lives. So think of this as our exposure to language. And so I'd like to start this uh, talk, right, by just pointing out this very obvious fact. Namely, our linguistic experience plays this very profound role in shaping our grammatical knowledge and language processing. So on the grammar side of things, I think it's a fairly uncontroversial point, right? If you, for example, grew up in an English-speaking environment, then you learn the rules of English as a child. But if you were to grow up in a Japanese kind of environment, then of course you will learn the rules of Japanese. Um, on the psycholinguistic side of things, there's also a kind of a sort of conceptually similar point to be made. So let's consider word recognition or let's go decision. Um, English speakers can recognize words like, in, like belief very quickly, right? If they ask, if you ask like, oh, is this an English word? They'll say yes, right away. And this uh, speed of response is associated with the fact that belief is high frequency. And in contrast, if you give people words like frenzy and say, is this a word of English? They will eventually say yes, but they'll, bit, they'll need a bit of time. And this is because frenzy is low frequency, right? So this is like, we are all sensitive to the frequencies of like words and then that affects the way we respond to uh, these words in a lab setting. Okay, so this kind of view, right, that there's this close relationship between linguistic experience and grammars and processing also has received this boost thanks to recent advances in computational models. Uh, many of you might have heard of this term language models or recurrent neural networks. So this refers to a class of models that are actually tasked to discover statistical regularities of words inside a corpus. So if you think about it, you are just giving this big corpus like, you know, coca or, um, you know, so, some equivalent, you know, corpus of like Japanese or Chinese. And you're asking the model, please go and find interesting patterns, right? How are the words co-occurring? And so these models are basically supposed to find interesting patterns based on their own linguistic experience, so to speak. And uh, we know from a lot of research that actually these models do really well. So today, when you use things like machine translation or autocomplete or like, you know, this kind of spell check, you are using these models, right, in an everyday uh, application setting. And linguists have, of course, also tried to apply these models in research. And we have found that actually these models can capture uh, a lot of interesting psycholinguistic and grammatical phenomena. So these models can predict acceptability ratings given by humans. They can also predict long distance subject verb agreement. And interestingly, they can actually make mistakes that are similar to what humans would make. And in some, uh, some research, people have also found that these models can capture certain aspects of meaning. So this is really cool because if you think about it, these models are just trying to look out for patterns inside a corpus, inside their linguistic experience. And yet they can seem to do you know, all these kinds of things. Okay, so the picture so far seems to be that a lot of linguistic knowledge and behavior that we 
uh, study in linguistics seem to be modeled by the statistics of our everyday linguistic experience. So I'll call this kind of intuition or language statistics intuition or language statistics approach. Um, and today, instead of talking about how successful and you know, fantastic this line of research is, I want to uh, take a more critical perspective. I want to talk about the limits of this kind of uh, reasoning. So uh, there are cases where this language st uh, statistics approach runs into problems. And so how should we be thinking about these kinds of cases? So I'll present two case studies involving attitude verbs because that's something that I'm personally very interested in. Semantically, these are verbs that describe some kind of mental state or communication. So we are, think, we are talking about verbs like think, know, want, say, uh, claim, believe in English, right, and other languages. Syntactically speaking, they are also quite distinctive, right? Cross-linguistically, they appear with complement clauses. So we think we can tack on a complement clause like it's snowing. So we get a sentence, they think it's snowing. You can do the same for no, they know it's snowing, want, they want it to snow, believe, they believe it's snowing, etc. This is true for English. This is also true for Chinese, Japanese, you know, uh, um, Sulu, what have you, right? This is a very, very common kind of um, uh, pattern. Okay, so the first case study concerns uh, what I'll call bridge effects. So to illustrate them, let's consider sentence one. What did Kim think that Joe received? What did Kim say that Joe received? So these are WH questions, and for speakers of English and many other languages, these kinds of questions are perfectly natural. They sound acceptable. And notice here we have these attitude verbs, things say believe, and we can actually replace them with other attitude verbs like resent, shout, and hate. So we get sentence two, what did Kim resent that Joe received, what did Kim shout that Joe received. And for native speakers, right, these sentences sound funny. And so in, this is an old observation, right, and people have usually called think and say and other verbs, bridge verbs. And verbs like resent and shout, these are non-bridge verbs. Uh, and so that's why I'm calling this variation in acceptability bridge effects. So why is one good? Why is two bad, right? Those are bridge effects. And that's the question, uh, that's the kind of goal of this study. And then in the second case study, I'll switch gears and talk about the meanings of these verbs, right? Uh, I'll focus on two important subclasses, the belief verbs like think, know, and say, and the desire verbs like prefer, want, and love. So uh, the question is, well, here are some, uh, you know, two important subclasses of verbs. As adults, we know that these have important meaning differences, but how did we get there, right? When we were children, who told us what these verbs mean? How do we know? How do we find out? Okay, so um, as a preview of the kind of argument I'll be making, I'll be telling you that language statistics in these two case studies play at best an indirect role. And in fact, these case studies serve to remind us of the importance of other aspects of language, like learning biases, syntactic principles, pragmatic factors, and others. So the point is, you know, language statistics is important, but if you want to get a full picture of how language works, we need to be sensitive to these other aspects of language. Okay, so moving on, let's look at the first case study on bridge effects. So this is joint work with Diogo Almeida and John Sprouse. Um, and kind of a, a bit of a background, right? Bridge effects are interesting, not only because I think they have a lot of, you know, there's a lot to unpack there, but also because bridge effects tie in with a bigger debate about how you form WH questions. So for many of you in your classes, in your own research, you might have come across this term, island constraints or island effects. And these refer to restrictions on how you can front uh, WH words or how we can form relative clauses and WH questions. So these are a set of rules, a set of restrictions, and you can think of bridge effects as yet another set of restrictions. So in the literature, there's always been this debate going on for a few decades, right? How should we understand these restrictions? Do we want to blame them on syntactic principles, pragmatic factors, psycholinguistics, and so on? So how do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line? So for today, instead of kind of dwelling on the bigger theoretical debates, which I think is really for another talk on another day, I want to 
just focus on bridge effects and talk about existing theories. Because there are actually a couple of theories out there um, that make kind of your know, competing claims. And so I will talk about how you can evaluate these theories to with using large scale experiments. So how can we actually pick the best theory, right? We don't need several theories, we just need one good one. And unfortunately for us, I'll be telling you that actually it's hard to decide a winner. Uh, and in fact, we need to do better with our theorizing. Okay, so let's look at a couple of theories about bridge effects. So the first theory is what I'll call a frame frequency theory. So according to this theory, uh, bridge effects simply reflect how often a verb appears with a finite complement clause. So we looked at one and two just now, right? One is good, two is funny. How do we explain this? So this theory says that actually that's because a verb like think appears frequently with a complement clause. And a verb like resent is much more uncommon with a complement clause. Right, so this basically ties the acceptability difference to a frequency difference. One is good because it's high frequency, two is bad, it's low frequency. So this ties in nicely with a lot of uh, psycholinguistic research that shows you that low frequency structures tend to be difficult to process. And notice that this is a very kind of classic way of thinking about language statistics, right? This is like, okay, uh, here is a basic fact about how probable certain things are, and then this explains why we get the acceptability difference. Okay, um, moving on. Whoops, looks like the clicker is stuck. Uh, let's look at the second theory, which is the template-based theory. So this theory is also, in a sense, rooted in language statistics, even though the connection is a little more indirect, a more uh, nuanced. So it starts off with the observation that in languages like English, uh, WH questions with say and think are actually very common. So in our everyday lives, we hear people say things like, oh, where did you say they would do? Where do you think they went, right? So these, common, these questions are very commonplace, very familiar. Okay, so for the purposes of uh, processing a language, if you want to ask a question, if you want to understand a question, the theory says that we, right, as listeners, as speakers, will create templates that are based on the most frequently encountered questions in our everyday lives. So we draw on our linguistic experience to create these templates. So for example, these templates might include a say template, right, and a think template. So the idea is that each template has some kind of structure, a basic like kind of meaning kind of a template. All you need to do is to slot in a, a good WH word, a suitable clause, and then voila, you have a question, right? So you don't have to create a question from scratch in your head. Makes life easier. So going back to our examples, right? Uh, if you encounter a sentence like, what did Kim think that Joe received? And you want to process it, what do you do? Simple, use your think template, right? Because it has the verb think. But what if you have a, a sentence like, what did Kim resent that Joe received? Oh, this is trickier because you have to deal with a sentence with resent. But in your everyday linguistic experience, I've never seen resent really. So you need to, uh, to understand this, you need to like modify an existing template, but right? you might take the say template and change it. And according to this theory, there is a cost to making that kind of modification. So this cost actually increases with semantic distance from say and think. So in the case of resent, right? Resent basically is semantically quite different from say, quite different from think. And so there's a cost to making a change to accommodate resent. And therefore we feel that this second sentence is trickier, difficult to understand, right? It's, so it's this kind of, uh, it's a processing uh, story. And then finally, for comprehensiveness, let's look at the third theory, which is based on information structure. So the idea here is that there are certain information structure uh, rules, constraints on how you can run the WH uh, element or how you can ask form a WH question. So here are two implementations that have been proposed. Um, let me just quickly step walk you through the intuition here, right? So the idea behind this, and to be to to be clear, right, this has nothing to do with like lang do with uh, linguistic experience or language statistics. But I think it's important to uh, talk about this because this is actually one of the older and more prominent theories about bridge effects. So uh, let's, walk th let's walk through the examples again, right? So let's think about think and resent. 
Um, so the idea is that think as an attitude verb has a special kind of information structure property. It has a special kind of pragmatic effect. It uh, specifically it foregrounds the complement clause. It makes the complement clause the focus of attention, the focus of the utterance. And then according to these pragmatic rules, the idea is that you can ask, you can question elements inside the, the clause as a result. And that's why the WH question is good. In contrast with resent, uh, resent, even though it's also an attitude verb, resent has a different kind of pragmatic property, different kind of information structure property. So resent specifically backgrounds the clause. And according to the same pragmatic rules or same information structure rules, you cannot question elements inside the clause. So that's why you get this difference between think and resent in WH questions. Okay, so now you have seen you know, three different theories about uh, bridge effects. And of course you might say, oh, that's kind of redundant. Really, we just want one good theory. So is there a way for us to decide, right? Uh, people have actually tried to sort out this question by running experiments and then trying to say, okay, this theory does the best, that theory doesn't do so good. However, uh, there is no clear consensus in the literature about which theory is actually better. So people have done experiments, but the results have been challenged. I think this problem is tied to a second, uh, more basic problem, which relates uh, to data quality. So if you were to actually compile a set of uh, attitude verbs, you quickly notice that English has hundreds of these kinds of verbs that allow finite complement clauses. And when you, you know, do a quick uh, survey of experiments dealing with these effects, you will notice that they actually have fairly small samples. And so you might ask, okay, how did these researchers pick their samples, right? How did they test those verbs? And can we actually trust the results, right, associated with small samples? Are they representative? So to address this problem, my collaborators and I actually um, took an exhaustive experimental approach. So what we did was to, you know, ask people, we show people questions like what did Kim think that uh, Joe received, what did Kim resent that Joe received, and we asked people to rate them, rate these sentences one to seven, one bad, seven good. Um, and then our approach here is exhaustive. We surveyed 640 attitude verbs in English. So this is not just some like small random sample, this is intended to be a full set of verbs in English. And so along the way, we recruited like 9,000 participants on the internet. So this is a, a fairly large scale uh, survey. And then earlier I talked about three different theories, right? Saying that acceptability is tied to frequency, semantic similarity, information structure. So for each of the 640 verbs, we also picked up, sorry, we also compiled, you know, frequency measures, semantic measures and information structure measures. So with this kind of data set, then we can actually calculate correlations. Like for example, the frequency theory says frequency is correlated with acceptability. So can we do that correlation? What kind of correlation can we find? Right? Is there a theory that gives you a really high correlation? Because if there is, then that's the good theory that we want. So I'm going to show you three charts here, um, one for each theory. Um, so these are actually the results of our uh, analysis. So you can see, for example, think is in the top right. So that tells you that think is highly acceptable and it occurs frequently with a clause. Resent is in the middle. So resent is less good and it's also less frequent with a clause. So, so far this is consistent with our intuitions. But if you were to look at the bigger plot, right? Uh, each dot here is actually one attitude verb. So you can see that actually for the vast majority of dots, right, they are scattered all over the place. There is not a clear kind of correlation that we might expect. Um, and you can see that there is a positive slope, which is actually in the correct direction, but the R squared value is low. So the R squared here is 0 0.048. That tells you that frequency explains only about 4.8% of all variation in acceptability. And then, so that's for frequency theories. We can do the same for template-based theories and information structure theories. Uh, visually speaking, you can see that the plots look very similar. You have this big cloud of dots, right? There's not a clear trend, even though actually statistically you can see these slopes, which are also in the right direction. But you can see that the R squared values are low, right? About 0 0.03 to 0 
So overall, they tell you that these different theories explain about 3% to 10% of all variation and acceptability. And so this is not good news because it means that about 90% of the, of the uh, acceptability variation is unaccounted for. So we don't know what's going on. So the kind of takeaway here is that actually these accounts, right, which are based on language statistics or information structure are not very good predictors of bridge effects. So this tells you that actually prior results, prior experimental results are likely to have verb sampling problems. If they found a clear correlation, chances are that's because they had a small sample, wasn't representative. So you know, the results are actually a little iffy. Um, and you know, because when we do, when we look at a full set of verbs, we see the existing theories are actually quite weak. Okay, so the results also tell us that we need to do better with our theories, right? We don't want to just have something that explains 10% of variation. So one thing we did or we have done is to start looking at the data we have to try to see if there are patterns that we might have missed. And so one observation that we have made is that it looks like verb clauses seem to matter, specifically attitude verbs that allow non-finite and finite clauses like believe, expect, claim, tend to have higher relative acceptability. But I think this observation also raises a couple of questions. So, uh, so it's interesting that we see this kind of correlation, but you know, is it, what does it tell us really, right? Is it tied to the syntax of these verbs? Does it mean that bridge effects is syntactically uh, kind of has a syntactic component to it? Or is it related to verb semantics or pragmatics? And then the second issue is, um, you know, we see cross-linguistic variation in bridge effects. Uh, but our observations here are all based on English. So is there a way for us to tie our current observations with what people have said about bridge effects in other languages? So I think these are some future you know, areas that need further exploration. Okay, so next I'd like to move on to the second case study, which is uh, learning uh, the meanings of these verbs. And this is joint work with Aaron White, uh, Jiaxun Liao, Valentin Lacard, and Jeff Litz. So uh, for this case study, I'll say more about you know, the meanings of these uh, belief and desire verbs, and then introduce the idea of syntactic bootstrapping as a way of um, as a as a way of explaining how children learn these verbs and their meanings. Uh, and then I'll point out this problem for syntactic bootstrapping that's posed by a language like Mandarin Chinese and in fact many other uh, Asian languages. And then I'll evaluate the severity of the problem with a corpus analysis and a computational model. Okay, so uh, let's go back to belief and desire verbs again. So earlier I said there are two important classes, um, but exactly how are they different? So with belief verbs, I think the intuition is that belief verbs express commitments to truth or truths of statements. So when we say uh, Dora thinks Kim went to bed, we are saying that Dora is committed to the truth of the statement Kim went to bed. Right, Dora says it's true, Dora does not say it's false. Uh, in contrast, desire verbs don't have that kind of commitment. Desire verbs merely express preferences. So when we say Dora wants Kim to go to bed, Dora has a preference right, for a situation where Kim goes to bed. But Dora doesn't care about whether it's true or not that Kim went to bed. So there's no commitment. So this is a very basic distinction right, between belief and desire verbs. It's true for English, but it's also true for lots of other languages. Um, you know, these are this is a very you know recur, this is a recurring kind of effect. So the question is, okay, for us adults, right, we can perceive this kind of difference, but how did how do children actually figure out this difference? How do they know the meaning of thing? How they do know the meaning of want? And it's uh, in interesting to kind of think about this because uh, this is not a problem that. Uh, we find for many other words. So many words have obvious physical correlates. Uh, let's take an example like statue. If someone says, look at the statue, and you are a child, you don't know what statue means, one thing you could do is to try to look around. And maybe you'll see this big physical object right there, and you say, oh, uh, this thing, I don't know what it's called. Maybe that's a statue. So you can kind of associate, right? New words with new things. So that's one strategy you could use. But for verbs like think and want, this strategy runs into problems. Why? Because actually 
belief and desire verbs more generally describe these abstract mental states, right? You want something, but that's not something that you express physically. You cannot, as a learner, you cannot just like try to look at someone or look at something and try to say, oh, that's thinking or, oh, that's wanting. Right? You can try to guess, but maybe you're not going to guess correctly. So, so this is the kind of basic problem, right? And because these uh, mental states are so abstract, it's also difficult to imagine someone telling you what these words actually mean. But yet we know that children actually succeed in learning these differences. So as early as ages three and four, uh, children start to use words like want and think, and they can even interpret them like an adult does. So they actually succeed at an early age. And that's why this uh, kind of problem is interesting. So a solution to this problem is, uh, has been uh, mooted in the literature and it's called syntactic bootstrapping. Uh, the intuition is that basically verb meanings can be very tricky to observe, right? Because they can be very abstract. But syn the syntax of these verbs can be quite easy to observe. And so maybe learners can actually use syntax to learn semantics. So that's what syntactic bootstrapping really means. And so this is where there are also interesting connections with linguistic theory. So for, you know, the idea is that actually there's a lot of research in formal semantics and formal syntax showing that actually verb meanings are closely correlated with syntax. So this is where linguistic theory and linguistic uh, and language acquisition can actually come together and, uh, you know, support each other. Okay, so let's look at how this might work for belief and desire verbs. So in the... Uh, I would say the semantics and syntax literature has been pointed out that actually uh, belief and desire verbs have very different sy syntactic properties. So let's consider English as an example, right? Um, so we have think and want, right? Belief versus desire. Uh, and it's been noted right, over and over again that actually belief verbs often have finite clauses. So Dora thinks King went to bed. We have a clause, think Kim went to bed. And the verb here is went, which is finite. So this is a finite clause. In contrast with want, we have a desire verb. Dora once came to go to bed. The clause is non-finite. We have a non-finite verb to go. Right, so this is a, a very basic distinction. Uh, and on top of that, we also uh, see that belief clauses tend to resemble declarative sentences. So Dora thinks Kim went to bed is finite. Um, and if you look at the complement clause, Kim went to bed, that is also that looks like exactly like a declarative sentence. Um, and a similar kind of generalization has also been established for languages like French and other Romance languages, right? So in French, belief clauses look like declarative, sorry, belief clauses look different from desire clauses and belief clauses look like declarative sentences. So there's this general abstract uh, pattern going on. Um, and then of course, I want to point out, right, that the generalizations are stated somewhat differently. So in English, the generalization is stated in terms of finiteness, uh, but in French, it's in terms of mood, indicative mood, subjunctive mood. But the overall kind of abstract pattern still holds. Okay, so going back to the syntactic bootstrapping, um, the idea is, well, learners can try to use syntax to figure out semantics. So we see, right, from all this, that actually it looks like this could be very, uh, these patterns can be very useful to learners. Right, because if they pay attention to their linguistic experience, right, and then they pay attention to uh, the frames that belief verbs occur with and desire verbs occur with, then they can see all these differences popping up. And then they can tell, oh, well, looks like the, maybe the meanings are different here. So it's in this sense very helpful, but it's also in a sense not enough because it only tells learners that there are differences, but they, it doesn't tell the learners what exactly the differences are. Right, what is the meaning of these books? You still don't have an idea. So to explain how young children can actually succeed, we actually often need to say something stronger, more specific. So we are basically, I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that the statistics, right, of linguistic experience is not enough. Uh, so here is a proposal that uh, me and my collaborators have defended, right? The idea is if you are a learner and you see an attitude verb, you want to look at the, the complement clause. And then if you think it looks like a declarative sentence, then you conclude that the verb is actually a belief verb. And if not, you don't draw that conclusion. You might say, oh, it's a desired verb. So this is 
you can see that this uh, kind of learning process builds in the semantics. And you can think of this as a bias, a tendency for learners to do this without further prompting or further instruction, but right? they just know to do it. Okay, so, uh, so we suggest that this is actually what's going on that would explain how children can learn the meanings of these verbs very quickly. Okay, so you might ask, okay, well, why would you have this kind of bias in the first place? Uh, this is where I think you could also kind of think about the pragmatics. So let's take a quick detour. Uh, let's start off with a declarative sentence like Kim went to bed. So pragmatically speaking, this declarative sentence is making a direct assertion. Okay. I, as a speaker, am committing to the idea or committing to a statement, Kim went to bed. And then let's consider the belief verb like think. Dora thinks Kim went to bed. Uh, for... Um, Pragmatically speaking, right, this is actually often used to make indirect assertions. So when I say Dora thinks Kim went to bed, I am saying that I am indirectly asserting Kim went to bed. And I'm also, so I'm indirectly committing to the truth of Kim went to bed. And likewise, I'm also saying that Dora is committed to the truth of Kim went to bed. So what we are suggesting here is that maybe learners are sensitive to not only the syntactic parallels, right, but they're also sensitive to the pragmatic parallels, right? This is a direct assertion. That's an indirect assertion. Both of them involve truth judgments. So maybe what learners are doing here is that they are kind of reasoning backwards. They say, oh, it looks like think expresses truth judgments and therefore think is a belief verb because that's what belief verbs do. And importantly, they won't do that with want because want is not used for making any kind of indirect assertions. Okay, so going back to the uh, account here, uh, what I've done is to kind of explain how this kind of learning process might work, this learning strategy might work. And so let's think about whether this is actually a workable or feasible strategy. So uh, there's an important ingredient right in this account, namely you need to have belief and desire clauses to look different. And so this requirement is easily met in languages that have finiteness and mood morphology like English and Romance. But we know that not all languages are like that, right? So uh, for example, Mandarin Chinese famously doesn't have finiteness or mood morphology, right? So I'll spend the rest of this section talking about Mandarin. But really, Mandarin is just a, a representative example, right? Because there are a lot of other languages, right? Vietnamese, Thai, Malay, right? Lots of uh, Eastern, East Asian languages or even uh, African languages that also lack these kinds of, uh, you know, verbal morphology. So what happens there, right? Can, if they are not... If they don't look so distinct, right, maybe learners are going to draw the wrong semantic conclusions. They might think that think means think is a desire verb, what is a belief verb. Okay, so to be clear, right, I'm not saying that there's no grammatical difference whatsoever in uh, languages like Mandarin or, you know, Thai or Malay for that matter. Uh, in fact, within Mandarin, right, in the syntax literature, people have pointed out differences, grammatical differences between belief verbs and desire verbs. Uh, so, here are three important features. Uh, belief cl clauses right, often allow overt subjects, modals, and aspect markers, but desire clauses do not. Um, so, uh, in fact, myself and some other researchers have actually gone as far as to say that uh, languages like Mandarin make a finiteness distinction, which is what we find in other languages. But setting aside these kind of theoretical syntactic uh, claims, right, there is still kind of a problem for syntactic bootstrapping. Namely, these features, right? Overt subjects, modals, aspect markers are all optional, which means that they can be omitted in the right context. And this is a problem for the learner. So to see why, let's uh, walk through two scenarios. So the first one is a good scenario. So this is a Mandarin sentence. So suppose, let's imagine ourselves as Mandarin learners. And then here you come across this verb jieta, which means like feel or think. And, he's, and here you hear sentences like, I think they might have eaten fruit. So in this kind of sentence, you see that the clause of the belief verb has a subject, a model, and, a, and an aspect marker. And then along the way, you also come across sentences like, I like eat fruit, meaning I like to eat fruit. So here you see that the desire clause has only a verb and an object. There is no subject, no model, no aspect marker. So in this case, if you're a learner trying to apply syntactic bootstrapping, this is good news because there's a clear difference. But you could also be in a not so happy situation. 
right? So like I said just now, Mandarin does not, Mandarin can let you drop subjects, uh, models, and aspect markers, right? Much like you know, Japanese, Korean, lots of Asian languages. So you might be a Mandarin learner who hears sentences like I like or I think eat fruit, meaning I think they eat fruit, right? But you just have pro drop, you don't say the subject. Um, and then at the same time, you'll hear sentences like I like eat fruit. So here, the two sentences don't have uh, overt subjects, models, and aspect markers. And worse yet, you might come across declarative sentences that also don't have overt subjects, models, and aspect markers. So you might come across eat fruit, meaning they eat fruit. So if you're a learner, then this is really tricky, right? You have a belief verb, you have a desire verb, and you have declarative sentences, but the relevant clauses here all look the same. So you cannot tell what the difference is, syntactically speaking. And semantically speaking, that implies that you cannot tell what the semantic differences are. So you are going to be stuck. So this is a kind of the kind of um, uh, problem that, that a Mandarin learner might be stuck with. So a way out of this problem is to actually uh, take a step back and think about linguistic experience again. So maybe learners can actually track the overall distribution of features like subjects and models and aspect markers in their overall linguistic experience. So they can compute the statistics overall. And maybe they will see that uh, belief clauses and desire clauses look quite different. And if that's the case, then you know that's a difference, then they can apply bootstrapping. So you can ask two questions. Well, is this actually the case? And second, right, if you see differentiation, are the clear differences clear enough for the learners? So let's take a look at this uh, corpus analysis that we did. So this is based on child-directed speech. So we go through you know, what young children hear their parents say around them. And I'm showing you the statistics for overt subjects, models, and aspect markers, but I'll just focus on overt subjects. So what you see here is that about 50, so what you're looking here in a black bar, right? So that's for declaratives. That tells you that um, uh, overt subjects appear about 55% of the time in declaratives. So another 45% of declarative sentences are overt subjects. And then for belief clauses, right, you can see that actually overt subjects are also somewhat frequent about 50% of the time. So visually speaking, this tells you that actually declarative sentences and belief clauses look quite similar in terms of overt subjects, which is good news because that's what the account needs. Uh, second, let's compare belief and desire clauses. So you can see uh, desire clauses actually sometimes occur with overt subjects, but they are very, very rare, about 5% of the time. So this is also good news for the syntactic bootstrapping story because uh, you can see here that actually in the overall kind of corpus, uh, Mandarin learners, uh, sorry, let me take a step back. In the overall um, Corpus belief clauses look very different from desire clauses in terms of overt subjects. And we see the same pattern with like models and aspect markers, even though the patterns are a little, uh, little more subtle, a little more tricky to, to pick out. So the point here is that actually, if you were to aggregate and compute the statistics, you can see that um, you know, belief clauses look different from desire clauses and belief clauses look like declaratives, even in a language like Mandarin. So this is actually a kind of a necessary ingredient for successful bootstrapping. But you can say, okay, well, here are differences, but actually are these differences big enough? Maybe they are too small. So the next thing we did was to simulate a learner. Here we adapted this computational model uh, proposed by Aaron White. So this model actually builds in the learning bias. So uh, this recall the bias that I mentioned earlier, right? The idea is to check the complement clause and see whether it looks like a declarative. If it looks like a declarative, then say, probably this is a belief verb. Otherwise say that this is probably a desire verb. So this model actually kind of hard codes this bias inside it. And uh, the cool thing was that this model was able to pick out the important semantic dis distinctions for English attitude verbs using English data. But this model was not tested on any other languages. So what we did was to say, okay, does this work with Mandarin data? Can the same model succeed? So I will skip the details of the model. I'm happy to talk about it later. Uh, I want to show you the modeling results. So here are 10 um, most common attitude verbs in Mandarin. 
uh, let's zoom in on want. That's Yao. So want uh, Yao is a desired verb in Mandarin, and you can see um, as the model proceeds, right, going from left to right, over time it concludes that Yao has a very high probability of having desired semantics and a low probability of having belief semantics. So this is good news. This is exactly what you know Yao and want are. And then let's consider jitter, uh, which is feel or think. And so over time, the model concludes that actually jitter or feel is likely to have belief semantics and unlikely to have desired semantics. So that's also good news because uh, you know, feel and jitter, these are all uh, belief verbs. And then we also replicated the results of what at all. So we fed the same model English. And we see that, so I won't go through the details here, but basically we see that the model picks up the correct semantic distinctions, again, for English verbs. So uh, to sum up this case study, right, I started off by saying actually belief and desire verbs are quite tricky to learn. And that's why we need to have syntactic bootstrapping. But we have a problem for bootstrapping because uh, for languages like Mandarin and also many other Asian languages, the clauses can look very different. And so what do we do? And happily, with the corpus analysis and the computational model, we show that actually the problem is not as bad as we thought, right? In fact, we have cross-linguistic support from the computational model, suggesting that this kind of morphosyntax plus bias can support the learning of the uh, meanings of these verbs. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I want to wrap up and conclude. Uh, we looked at two case studies, right? The first one was about bridge effects. And there, the lesson was that theories that are based on language statistics are quite unsatisfactory, right? They don't do a very good job. Uh, so, for example, the role of frequency is actually quite small. And to be fair, right, other theories also have that same problem. There's also a methodological point, which is that it's really important to have representative samples, right? We should be careful if you're dealing with small sample sizes. Uh, and then the second case study, we look at the meanings of these verbs and how you might learn them. And here, I think the takeaway is more nuanced, right? As it turns out, language experience and statistics can be very useful, right, as we saw. But um, like I said, the statistical differences in themselves are also of limited value because learners cannot get at the meaning of these books by looking at just the numbers. So like I said, you also need to have some kind of learning bias so that children can be pushed in the right direction. Okay, so going back to the kind of questions I laid out at the beginning, right? How does linguistic experience shape the way we learn and process language? How useful are statistics? And the key findings uh, basically are that, you know, there are limitations, right? So um, in fact, they tell us that we need to be very careful with our theories. We want theories that can delineate the roles of statistics and biases, syntax, pragmatics, and so on. And I hope eventually we can kind of integrate all these perspectives to build a richer, more nuanced perspective of how human language works. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take questions. Okay, so we should open the floor to questions. Does anybody in the room or anybody on Zoom have any questions? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, yep. thank you for the presentation. That was very fascinating. So I had to leave uh, for a minute uh, at the end there. So maybe you talked about this a little bit, but I just had some questions about um, bootstrapping uh, like cross-linguistically in this case. So I know that you talk mostly about uh, uh, English and Mandarin, but you pointed out some some differences between the uh, like, I guess, semantic pressure or just bootstrapping in general across different languages, specifically Asian languages. Yeah. I was wondering if you happen to look at Japanese or any language that might work similarly uh, in distinguishing uh, like the the mood of desire and belief. Uh, in different like grammatical construction. So like to speak more concretely, I think, and native Japanese speakers, please correct me if they feel that this is not accurate, but I think belief is more commonly expressed through verb and then desire is more commonly expressed through like adverb or adjective right. modifying something. Yeah. Does this, you feel, have any sort of influence on constructing a model of semantics 
or on the bootstrapping process or potentially like uh, in age of acquisition and use? I think you talked, you mentioned that briefly as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's those are great questions. It's, uh, yeah, and, and that's, um, in fact, I might just add, right? It's really complicated when you start thinking about East Asian languages because not only can they express, you know, these um, concepts, shall we say, right? using verbs and adverbs, you can also use particles, right? Like we heard noda, for example, right, has the I think meaning, right? And then uh, in Mandarin, like there's this particle pa, which also kind of express that kind of I think. So then the question is, well, how, how do you pick up all these like nuances, right? How do you even learn the meanings of noda? Or how do you learn the meanings of pa? And yeah, so this is actually where the, uh, this is where the model actually itself cannot handle because the model is kind of set up to handle verbs. Um, and so, uh, you know, exactly how to accommodate all that, right? Kind of richness and cross-linguistic differences is one kind of technical problem. Um, but I think technically speaking, I think the, uh, bootstrapping hypothesis would suggest that there are going to be clear, you would predict, right, that there are going to be clear syntactic differences. So the question is actually, is this the case? So, you know, this is where I have a problem because I don't speak a lot of all these interesting Asian languages. So if you guys have any specific observations, right, I'll be happy to talk about them. Yeah, but no, I think that's exactly the kind of problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I had more questions, but I'll... Uh... We can come back maybe if we have time. Thank you for your talk, interesting talk. I have a question about um, future, no, desire verb and be verb. And this question may be similar to Pyrus's question. But I thought the desire verbs mainly uh, refers to the future things and uh, belief type verbs is mainly associated with the past, past things. Mm. Does that have any influence on the learning of the semantic differences or? I think if anything, yeah, I think that's a really yeah interesting question. So, because what you're suggesting is that maybe syntactic bootstrapping is not the only um, way, right? Because maybe you can pay attention to the meanings, right? Past or present, and then that can help you along. And so I think that's certainly possible actually. Uh, because I, I, I mean, honestly, I think like what we have seen is that syntax and pragmatics can influence the, can support a, a child, right? So I think it's very likely that semantics can be very useful too. Um, and I guess the question is actually, um, to what extent, right? This is that's the question with a lot of linguistics researchers: how 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 much of it is actually supported? Um, and so that's where where we don't really know. Um, it's tricky to tell from just looking at corpora because often, you know, you can tell, okay, here is a past tense verb, that's a future tense verb, but we actually don't know whether children are aware of these things. We cannot observe whether, we cannot observe children's awareness of, you know, maybe they're not, who knows if they're actually even paying attention. So that's, I think, the basic problem here. Um, but I, I think it's certainly very possible. It would tie in with another theory about language acquisition called semantic bootstrapping. And that's where you actually use the meanings of certain things to guess what kind of syntax they have. So I think that's certainly a very viable uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is Francesco Cangemi, University of Cologne. Uh, this was very interesting, and I wanted to rebound on the last point that uh, that had been made, uh, asking you to go back to slide thirty-seven, because I I was wondering whether the uh, uh, whether the example that you had there at the bottom, of, I, I apologize for my uh, ignorance of Mandarin, could be used as an as an imperative, uh, let's say, right? right. Yeah, no, that's right. So I was wondering, in that case, um, you might have some prosodic information going on, and uh, in one in one concept, one in in one in one approach to things, one might say, well, then you might have prosodic bootstrapping, mm -hmm. and so you might have prosodic bootstrapping, you might have semantic bootstrapping. At the same time, if I am telling a child to eat fruit rather than the, the 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 seventh batch of french fries for example i might be pointing at something 
And on top of that, a world will be created where the child knows that there's an action to be taken. This is relative to the future past distinction. There's an action to be taken to modulate the affective scenario in which the child is embedded with the adult who's issuing a command. So in a sense, I would be wondering, rather than syntactic bootstrapping, prosodic bootstrapping, semantic bootstrapping, isn't it an idea of the tendency that we might sometimes have as linguists and as people who like formalisms to reduce the complexity of reality? And then once we've done this, we wonder at the poverty of the of the stimulus and we try and account for the poverty of the stimulus and the functioning of the system despite the poverty of the stimulus isn't the stimulus very very rich and multimodal i i'm wondering whether this is for the for the learner whether this is a problem at all or whether this is a problem for the linguist right. yeah no I, I think that's that's a great kind of like pushback right um i think the question is Certainly, the, the input looks like it's very rich, right? Because here I'm saying, oh, you have to look at the, in fact, I'm saying you have to look at the pragmatics, you have to look at the syntax, and then you are pointing out, like, you know, look at the tense, look at the uh, situation. Um, and I, I guess the question, in, in some sense, it's also kind of uh, empirical, which is we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the, the learner, right? Are they able to detect all these things around, around them? So I think for, so, so for example, like going to your observation about like prosody, um, the, the issue is, well, can, to what extent are learners like picking up on the prosodic cues? And I, I guess in the case of Mandarin, this can be maybe tricky because Mandarin is tonal. So you need the, the Mandarin learner to not only like be first of all, you know, familiar with the tones of the language, but also figure out what kind of like prosodic contours and how that affects the actual kind of a production. So, so I think in a, in a sense that's empirical, like we, we I, I personally, I don't know what the effects are for the Mandarin learner, right? At age two, I don't know how, how much tonal or prosody stuff they know. I don't know what the effects are for ages three and four. But I think ideally, yes, I think it's, I think the picture that I would be very happy with is that actually learners just like try to pull together all sorts of information they can get, right? In order to help them solve this kind of problem. And so it'd be, It'd be nice if you can really kind of tie together, integrate all these different ways, and then tell a nicer, more accurate story than what we currently have. Yeah, but I think that's certainly like a, it's, yeah, it's just like, you know, I don't know what the facts are, but I think it's definitely a possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm Sunghun Lee from ICU. Uh, I'm piggybacking on uh, Francisco's question because I think uh, perhaps. Uh, if we can look at the child-directed speech, uh, uh, childish is very, very text-based. I believe the Mandarin uh, database probably was also mm -hmm. text-based database. But if there's a way to look at child-directed speech, uh, just for, I, I thought about yeah. that, those sentences in, let's say, Korean. Mm -hmm. I would, When I talk to a child, I would say, like, I, yeah, I like to eat the fruit. And like you, you have to kind of emphasize these kind of desire verbs, whereas... Yeah. I wouldn't talk to a child. To, I think to eat. I think <laughs> eating fruit, or so. I th I think I want to eat fruit, or something like that. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering whether those kind of uh, CDS uh, data will tear apart uh, more, or like give us some certain kind of cues for uh, understanding how they actually uh, learn these kind of meanings from syntactically ambiguous situation like this yeah yeah no i think that's that's um yeah the the problem is really just the uh yeah the problem is that it's like you said right someone it's like the data set is mostly text uh based and so recordings can be quite tricky to come by um so uh although i think recently that's that has changed so people have started uploading more um kind of transcripts and also audio recordings, so we can actually compare. Um, but yeah, so I think that's definitely, that's definitely interesting. And, and this is, unre so currently actually I have this other kind of ongoing project trying to figure out whether you can, uh, not so much on this topic, but actually also looking at how prosodic cues in child-directed speech can be used to maybe help children figure out like 
when a question is a question versus a statement. So that's actually, I, I think that's, I think that's maybe, that's exactly the kind of thing that you have in mind. But I think it's, yeah, uh, definitely a, one of those things that I think, uh, you know, can be, again, very applicable here. It would be interesting if uh, we can ask people to do child-directed speech, for example, and then how they look at it. And uh, yeah. even in tonal languages, I think you can probably found, uh, find the tonal contour to be uh, constrained, but like the pitch range changes right. in these kind of set patterns. So anyway, yeah. there's, a, there's some thoughts about it. Yeah. 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 I th sorry, just, just another comment, right? Which is, I think the... Yeah, and maybe this is where you might have a perspective too. Like one problem I've actually encountered is um, often it's hard to, how should I put it? Like of, of, often we, often you can hear these differences, but I think the question is also like, you know, can, can the children pick up on these differences? Like we can, so I guess the question is, okay, so I think it's important to do that kind of analysis, but you also need to, test it out with children, perhaps, right? See whether they are sensitive to those uh, prosodic or tonal differences. Yeah. Yeah, two hands up. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's just a tiny, tiny rebound on the passing of the microphone. I just wanted to clarify that when I said um, sensitivity to prosody, yeah. I was not mainly meaning uh, word prosody and, and tone. Right. I was essentially meaning understanding whether the person talking to you is upset, is mm -hmm. inviting, and children are shown uh, have been shown to be sensitive to this yeah. thing before they become sensitive to anything else in language. Yeah. This is the first thing, uh, understanding whether you have done something wrong is the first thing that a, that a child learns. Understanding whether somebody is trying to soothe you, it's also at the very highest, earliest stages right. uh, of the learning. So just as a clarification, oh, for, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. meaning what I meant by prosody, for example, in this, right, in this right, case. Right. I see. Sorry for that. No, no. I was just passing. Hello. Okay, I think we don't have too much time, but I just wanted to to ask about um, some examples you gave on page 12. Sorry, this is a departure from the sure, yeah, yeah. previous conversation okay. a bit. 12, around there, yeah. So I think this is really fascinating because you said, the word, I think the word you used is, example two is funny. Because yeah. it's, it's uh, to, my first impression is to think of it as sort of somewhat ungrammatical, but not entirely ungrammatical. It kind of has like, an ambiguous semantic meaning and I think as a learner like not just a learner but someone acquiring you know uh, first language um, this presents an opportunity I don't know like positive or negative but it certainly presents an opportunity at like uh, at like reasoning and like um, uh, it's just an interesting kind of pit stop on the acquisition to semantics right mm -hmm. so I mean, I think the the first reading is really obvious because it just involves like basic WH movement, right? Uh, it's really easy to to figure out the meaning of this sentence using using that bridge verb, right? Oh, it's a very like naturalistic use. Uh, but moving on to the second, I mean, I, I kind of had written out, you, you know, the way that I would logically go about figuring out the semantic meaning to the sentence, and even even doing so, there's still ambiguity left. So, I mean, if you just look at what did Kim resent that Joe received? What did Kim resent that Joe received? My first instinct is to, to kind of translate that as what did Kim resent that Joe had received? So it is a thing, it is something he received. And then going further or going in a different direction, potentially, Kim resented the fact that Joe had received something, what was it? It's kind of like a more concrete way of framing that sentence or understandable way. And then I'm left with sort of two potential interpretations, which are Kim, resent, Kim resented that Joe received something or Kim resented that Joe received, period. So I was wondering if this sort of uh, input, first of all, if you thought of this as ungrammatical or if not, like what what sort of conundrum or what sort of opportunity does this, does this provide to like a language learner? Um, from the perspective of like acquisition of syntax. And I don't know if, if this kind of uh, is a obstruction to like the bootstrapping process or like constructing a model of semantics, but otherwise what 
influence would this sort of thing have on it? Right. So let me let me clarify. Right. So you're saying that um, there is this kind of are you saying that there's this kind of funniness with sentence two? Yeah, or, I mean, I would agree that there's a funniness to it. Sorry. I would agree that there's a funniness to it in that it's even if you you think about it, if you're trying to reason what the semantic meaning is, it's still ambiguous at the end of the day. However, you could uh -huh. you could make an educated guess of what it means, right? It's not entirely yes. ungrammatical. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So sorry. What what kind of ambiguity did you? Have? It's like ambiguity means two readings. What's the second one? Um. So I guess the the ambiguity is like the 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 main reading i suppose is that kim resented that joe had received something, something yeah. right um it? so the focus there is the thing so it's asking what is that thing and then alternatively i suppose it could you know as like a language learner or someone who just comes in contact with this sentence and it's not obvious you could think of it as more of like why did kim resent that joe received something in general like at all uh-huh okay so uh, what i'm trying to get at is that it's certainly like a funny sentence and the semantic even if you think about it the semantic meaning isn't obvious and it isn't clear necessarily and what sort of just influence does that have or what effect does that have on a uh, language learner yeah i think the issue is going to be so I, I think it's going to be more like sentences like two won't even appear in the experience of the learner because adults are not going to say this kind of sentences uh, not if they can help it, right? I mean, we, we all make mistakes, but I don't think we are going to say this kind of sentences. So the question is actually um, going to be like, okay, what do learners do in the absence of this kind of sentences, right? They are not going to hear it. They're not even going to hear adults say this is bad or oops, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Let me rephrase, right? So the, the question is actually, what do learners do from the things they cannot observe? And that's, I don't know. Um, and then to the extent that you think that these sentences are good, then it's really surprising. It's like, how do learners, you know, even though they never hear these kinds of things, right? How do they even get the sense that this is good, right? So this is the poverty of the stimulus thing that we kind of have been like kind of talking about in the background. Um, yeah, and, and so, you know, going to your other point about learning, then the question is, uh, you know, we need to make sure that whatever theory of learning we have, right, whether you use the bootstrapping model or something else, right, it needs to be able to explain that fact. Um, and then, uh, so, so it's like kind of a, a deliverable that we all now have. Um, and, but I think before we can answer that question, we need to first like determine like exactly in what way is this sentence problematic? Is it ungrammatical? Is it pragmatically weird? If it's ungrammatical, then your theory needs to, your learning theory needs to say, this is how you sort sentences into grammatical or ungrammatical, or this is how you sort sentences into pragmatically okay, pragmatically not okay, right? So you need to get the facts right first for adults before you can talk about what kids do. Okay. Oh, thank sorry. You. No, no, I was just gonna say, thank you for answering the question. I know it was kind of an odd one, but <laughs> no, thank you. One, no. Professor Lee. Go to slide 39. This is just maybe a clarification question, and you mentioned it. Uh, it's a CDS, the speech corpora was based on declarative sentences, and I was just wondering why uh, declarative sentences were used because uh, for some reason, maybe it was just uh, the examples that followed this slide later on, but uh, the desire clause sentences. Mm -hmm seemed like uh, may uh, appear more in interrogative, inter interrogative sentences. Right. So when you ask a, client, a child, do you like it? Do you hate it? Uh, and uh, and I was just wondering whether if you were looking at inter uh, questions instead of uh, declarative sentences, whether uh, the desire clause, the, what's that? the frequency, relative frequencies of the desire clause, may have increased or not. I don't know whether you saw the pattern or whether you mentioned it. Uh, maybe I missed it, but yeah, like, no, if I, you have any comments about it, that would be great. Yeah, yeah no, I, I glossed over a lot of it because of time. Um, basically for the, let me just, uh, so these declaratives are truly declaratives, right? So these are like, uh, it was raining or like, you know, uh, I hurt my leg. And then these belief clauses and desire clauses um, can appear either in questions, right, or assertions, right, declaratives, interrogatives, imperatives even. 
So this might be something like, um, I think, I think they are tired, or like, are they tired, or are, do you think they are tired? Right? Who thinks they are tired? So the belief clauses here are actually the complement clauses inside all kinds of like questions, declaratives, interrogatives, and the same for the desire clauses. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I didn't have a. I, I glossed over it. So thank yeah, you yeah. Thank that. you very much. Okay. Um, let's uh, thank the speaker once again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a very engaging talk. Um, I believe it's lunchtime. I'm not 100% certain if it's 11.37 or 12.37, but I think it's lunchtime. Uh, yeah, okay. So we'll break for lunch and come back whenever we're scheduled to. At 2. We're scheduled to return at 2. Okay.